Okay, this is the guy who um, he had found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he's known for this. Now, what I did is, it was not positive, it was not good, do not do as I do, I apologize for this, but we went into the Dead Sea Scroll Museum that is over there, and you're not supposed to take pictures, and there is a reason that you have, are going to be able to see pictures and videos, because I took them anyways. Um, I kept my camera low, I took the pictures, they didn't have any flash, so everything was all right, but um, I'm fessing up, that's what I did, etc. So, let's go through some of these. I just want you to be able to see, okay, this is still in the, um, in Bethlehem, and this is one of those pots, this is probably the best one, the guy who had found them said, that he told Israel, that's what I want, and they gave it to him. And so he got to keep that pot. This is the grandson, and this is just around the shop they have there in um, Bethlehem. So that's the grandfather. He's that's where they have that. This is the picture they have of him inside the museum for the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I just want to walk you through some of these. Okay, we got a problem already, don't we? Notice what you're seeing here. This is huge. May not look like much. These parchments that you're seeing here are 2,000 plus years old. They were found in the 19, 1940s. And I was extremely encouraged to see these. We got to see them in Seattle, or some of them in Seattle. And they send them around to different places to show them, but they have to have specific lighting, specific types of lighting, et cetera, because these, and that's why they don't want flash. <clears throat> and that's the concern with the pictures. But this, these parchments had, it, it was the community of the Essenes, and they had almost the entire Old Testament scriptures. It was a huge find. And that's why I wanted to show you that somebody had a hand up. Yes. They were in, when they found them, they were in, um, I, I didn't put the, the slides back up. If you remember they were in the, those, they found them in the caves and they were looking for an animal. They threw a rock in to try to scare the animal out. They heard a crash. They were in sealed that, um, let's do this. Where's my little, yes, I'm trying to get this to go backwards. There we go. There, these containers here were sealed. How? I don't know, could have been wax, whatever, but they were sealed. And so when they found those containers, it had the scriptures in them. They had complete books of the Old Testament. And one of the things that's encouraging with this to me Think to I me, mean, we're looking at over 2,000 years ago at these texts. And those texts that they found, they match. They're, to, to the fact that we can look back at texts 2,000 years old, and it matches the texts that were found hundreds and even a thousand plus years later, and they match. We have the word of God in our hands, and we can be confident. As we open this book, we have God's words. And this is exciting for me. And regardless of any of the debates that happen, we have the word of God. And those scrolls were a huge testament to that. So this was encouraging to me to be able to see that. And I wanted you, where is my, there it is. I wanted you to be able to see that as well. So that's the guy there. Okay. And those are the parchments. What you're seeing is 2,000 plus years old. Before the time of Jesus, these things were written out. It's awesome. Huh? Hebrew. Uh, well, 
It could have been in Aramaic at that point. It is, it's from the Old Testament in Hebrew. So whether it was done in Aramaic or done in Hebrew, I don't remember that. I think Aramaic. So it'd have been like our, um, oh, I'm pulling a brain freeze. The, the Greek translation of the Hebrew. I just forgot the name. No, not the Torah. That's the Hebrew. The Greek translation of the Hebrew text. Somebody can do a quick Google search and find. I just forgot that name. So when they found, be looking that up, when they found those texts, when they found all those, they also found all this stuff that was around there, all these implements, they found coins, everything that these Essenes would have had around them, they were finding. And the Essenes were... Just turn it down. We're good. We're good. So they found all this stuff, and we found these. They found these coins. These coins were there. The Essenes would come in, and they would they would relinquish everything they owned to the community, and that's why. Side thing again. You remember when uh, Jesus said, "You'll find a guy." Septuagint, thank you. You will find a guy carrying a pitcher of water, and men didn't do that, right? Essenes did because there were no women. They would go and have this community and they gave themselves to this community to translate and, and publish the word of God. That was what they wanted. They were an awesome group. So they found these coins. They found this pottery. All of this were in these caves. And it was just a huge, huge find. And I like, that's a small thing. But they, the way they displayed it, you notice it's like the, the scroll sticking up straight. So they did a really good job displaying that as well. But uh, I wanted you to be able to see these things and how they had, um, you know, the word of God was preserved for us. And this was good. Now, you also have heard me talk to you some about the street vendors in Jerusalem. I thought it was cool. So I went, this is one of those times I'm just going to show you. Here's the meat market. There's you a pine quarter and you go in and they'll just shave off for you whatever you want. And it's out in the open. It's 105 degrees. Yeah, it's just kind of intimidating. But this is where you get your meat. There's your fish. There's your, I don't know what kind of meat it was. But, and if it looks like you're in a small little area, keep in mind that is, I mean, here's a person. This is probably what, 10 feet? There's your store. This is what it's like to go shopping there. And this is the fish market. This guy was cool. I don't know how he did this, but this is all spices. And he stacked them all up and made a pyramid of all these different spices. I thought he did a great job. And, but you can get anything you want there. Uh, now, one of these in a minute, you're going to hear it. To me, it's eerie. I, I did not like it, but you'd hear it once in a while. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, this is the seventh station of the cross. Okay, the Catholic thing where they, the stations of the cross are where they would have where the, the different things that Jesus did as he's going to his crucifixion. So uh, they, they make very, very much a, a big thing of it. Um, going into, this is into the market. Again, the station of the cross. Okay. I put that one. That's all I had of it. That is what you hear as you're going through this place. That was the Muslim call to prayer. And you just hear it. And it's loud and blaring and it's eerie. It's very eerie. To, to me, it was eerie. But uh, they just go like, like nothing's happening. And this is what a typical, that, but that being said, this is what your typical marketplace is like all these shirts for sale over here they'll take all this fruit they'll squish it they'll make you a juice they'll do what you got to do it's just a typical market and it was um it was enjoyable to go through i enjoyed that part okay that's all preliminary what we're going to see now is two places this one is called every every place you go there's a Catholic church okay and we can we can we can discount that and say, you know, I wish the Catholics haven't, you know, wouldn't make everything the way it is. But one of the things they did, and I appreciate this, is early on they marked places. 
where the places traditionally were, and they kept that for us. Now, is it accurate? I don't know. But we got some idea of where things might have been based on what they did back in the first, second, third centuries. And I'm grateful for that. This is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Now, this building, it was built way later. Okay. I mean, so this is only less than 200 years old. So there's not, it's not as big of a deal, but I say not as big of a deal. Parts of this are a whole lot older than that, like what we're seeing right here. And we'll see this in a second. Church of the Holy Sepulchre, what this was, this is the spot where some believe that Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose again. They believe that this is the spot. It, it's not my first choice. I'm not saying it's not because I don't know, but it's not my first choice, and I'm going to show you why in a moment. Now, this, this church, again, 19th century church, built right outside the original city walls. Now it's inside the walls because they expanded them after the first century. Those got ex expanded and it was inside. So it was rebuilt later on. So let's let's take before we look at all these pictures, let's have I'm gonna have somebody read who has there's two of them, John 19, 16 to 22. Who has the 16 starting it off? You have it? Okay, so John. Chapter 19, starting with verse 16. I'm guessing it's going to go through about 19 or 19. Okay, then who has the 20 to 22? Okay, so you two read that one and we're ready to go. Then delivered him again, therefore, that he was crucified, and they took him and the way. And he buried him with his cross and corpse into a place called the Pearl of Skull, which is called the Hebrew Pearl Gospel, where they crucified him. Three other witnesses on either side walk and do the same thing. The title was and so the title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This title was then read many of the Jews, like being crucified in my city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and in Latin. Then for the chief priests of the Jews, priests of the Jews, who was titled. Write not the king of the Jews, but from today I am the king of the Jews. Tyler answered, What I have written, I have written. Okay, so there that's the background of what's happening somewhere around this place. Now, just as a little bit of history, in about 139, the emperor Hayden, he hated Christianity. He wanted it destroyed. And what he would do is come to sites that were traditionally Christian, and he would destroy those sites. And what he did at this site was he built a palace over the church that had been established here. He tore it down, and he put up a pagan temple over this site. And other historians wrote about this. In 313, so about 200 years later, is when Constantine legalized Christianity. Constantine's mom was Helena. She's the one, you remember again, the church in Bethlehem, she came from Rome and built about, had, she had about three, four churches built. This is one of them. She had this place built. And the fact that people recognize this site is a major deal in, um, in saying this very well could have been the original. This could have been the correct site. It was destroyed. That, so that's in the 300s. At some point during there, it was destroyed, and the Crusaders rebuilt it in 1049. The Muslims came in, took over in 1187, and I don't know why they do this, but you'll notice here, this right there was two doors. The right-hand door, they love to block in doors, and I'm not sure why they do that, but they blocked in this door, and they left this one, and I'm going to show you this. So you can have a little bit of a reference to how big this place is. Okay, there's the, the two doors. You can see now with some people there what that door looks like. Do you remember the friend that I made up there? My roommate, the guy was six seven. a okay, big, big guy. Okay, this picture is of him in front of that door. Okay, that gives you an idea. Six foot seven, and he looks like a midget in front of a door. 
This place is huge. Oh, no. Oh, no. They can get in. What I'm showing on this is, I mean, this place is just plain ornate, and you're going to see a lot of this. This is where, and again, I'm not saying yes, no, I don't know. They that this is where they believe those who hold that this is the site of the crucifixion and the burial and the resurrection. They're holding that this rock that they had encased in this wall is part of the rock of the cross. That's their claim. And the, the Catholic Church loves or loved to do this. They like to have the spot, the thing, and they put too much emphasis on that. And they like to, to worship, in a sense, those sites. This is the same thing with the, the rock that would be behind this window. This is just people waiting to get in. Oh, yes. I'm not sure I understood all of this. There was a church. This is the what was on the inside, and this they built all over the outside. So they've got a church within the church. It's just very decorative, etc. And that is what is the where they would be honoring or celebrating the place where Jesus was crucified. Okay. As you go further down, and these in these places, it's, and this is no this was no exception. They share power, so you have a building that is partly controlled by Roman Catholic, partly by Greek Orthodox, partly by by various ones. This section that we're in right here is a Syrian Orthodox chapel, and that place, this thing here, is just a dilapidated altar that they used to use. Yes. Oh, yes. You don't believe Jesus who said it. So that site right there at the end is nothing. Absolutely zero. They don't. That means nothing to them. They I, they would probably, well, okay. The Jews would say this is a historical place. And they like it because it generates a lot of income. This is the fifth biggest industry in Israel, the tourism. And us coming over generates a lot of money for them. They love it. It's split, yes. And now there's some of them, a few of them that the, that the um, Jewish antiquities, they, they do a few, not many. Most of it is Catholic, Greek Orthodox, they split it. And, uh, but yeah, that's a good point. So this one is, and this is why I have trouble saying this is the original place. This was just outside of it. You notice here, these are two tombs, and I'm going to be talking about these on a video in a second. These are sealed, sealed tombs. And these are little, these are down this low. It's more like a coffin. That's not the right word. Um, the thing where you push the casket in. This one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You'll know these. That's what these are like. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. That's what they, that, again, that's what they, whoever they is, that's what they say. They believe that was Joseph of Arimathea, Arimathea, Nicodemus. They think those are their two spots. Here's why I don't like it. Now, just think about what happened. And we're going to look at these passages in just a second. When Mary was outside of the tomb, when John and, when John and Peter had their race, you remember, one stopped, bent down and looked in. And what did Peter do? You're not going to run into those things. You're not running into them. It's just not happening. 
All that is is a mausoleum type shoot. That's why I have trouble with that saying you know, that's the place because that part didn't make sense to me. But that gives you an idea of where, but there is validity in the arguments of that could be the place of the crucifixion. So that gives you an idea of, of what they're looking at, okay? Um, John 19, 38 to 42. Is that one section or does that get split up? 38 to 42. Okay, go ahead. Uh oh, I'm sorry. So that gives you the idea of what was going on around them. And, and I apologize for starting this thing up. You're going to see how, again, it, it's the wrong emphasis, but you've got to admire some of this. Don't get dizzy. All these are individual pieces on that day. Amazing how all of that mosaic is just little bitty pieces glued or whatever wants. And that gives you the idea of what, you know, just the, um, I don't know the words for it, but the, the way it's just when you get into the Catholic production of things, it's very ornate. And I had a Catholic come in here one time and they looked around and they said that they were really struck by the poverty of our church. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, with the Catholic church, everything's like this. Ours is poor. And, and I don't think it is, but that's how they view it. And this is what they're used to. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this is just the, the, the thing with the, um, again, this, where the cross they believe it was. Uh, that one I'm not recalling. Okay. This area of waters. That's the shopping glass. And that's what we back in the day. And that's what's still left. And it, it was very well uh, preserved. And one of the things that is interesting is those stones that are there were the ones that Jesus would have walked on. It was there, there's just original. And that's exciting to see that those things are still there, just validating um, what we have and what we've seen. So, that being the case, that takes us now to this. Sentence 
in our culture where you take them into this private room and everything's humane and blah, blah, blah. That's not what they did crucifixions as a show of force and to make a public example. They wanted it on a public road. They wanted it where it was seen in this area, right, where those buses are, was a major thoroughfare. And this, and th th this is, you may have seen the pictures of the, the skull. Okay, I can't say yes or no. It, it, does it look like a skull? Yes, it does. And you'll see another picture that looks more like it in a few minutes. Um, before we show more of these, uh, let's go ahead and read John 20, 1 to 10. Who's got one? Okay, you take one to five. All right. Okay, let's look at some of these. Does it, what I want you to see here is the place. And here's why. This tomb, who owned, who owned that tomb that had not been used? What was his name? Uh, uh, and, yes. Joseph of... Yes. Okay. He owned the place. Was he a rich man? Yes. He had had this tomb hewed out. He had had it dug... This was this guy had money. So this is the picture that they had when they first found this. This is the picture they took. There's the skull, the place of the skull, Gagatha. This was the big find. And this was less than a hundred years ago. So this was a big find for them. This is in this garden. The garden's gorgeous. Okay. Um, while you're in here, they'll often do which is now in that box, but they, that's where we did a communion service, and they have the, you know, the, it's just it's just a beautiful place. It's very peaceful, and it's it, it's worth going to. This, and I'm going to be talking about it in a video clip in just a second. This was a um, um, a wine where they would press the wine, press the grapes, and they if they had it. We, we they would stomp them, and they had a place for the juice to go. The place was a working orchard. It was a wealthy person's place. And so it makes sense that that's where Joseph would have owned something. It's just another view of that same um, wine press. Now, given the verses that were just read, they stooped down. They looked. It was a low door. One, though, was able to go in. That helps us as we look at this. You know, I'll show you that in just a second because uh, it's got that, it has that there. Uh, one of the, like these, did that make sense what these were? After the flesh was gone, you left with the bones, 
They would pick up the bones and put them in the little boxes, and that would go and do it. That's what would be kept was the little box with the bones in it because the flesh had all rotted. It's gone. So now th that's a good, and that is a very good point with the stone being rolled. And that's another reason why those other little mausoleum tombs didn't make as much sense to me, whereas this did. So let's look at this. That's an excellent point. If you look right here across the front was a trough where the stone would go. Yeah, and we're going to see a stone in just a minute. Now, one of the things you'll notice here, and I don't know, it's been 2,000 years, okay? You notice they built this in. They closed it in. If this was hewed out, this door, it, it, over time, it very well could have collapsed in. It could have been broken in. But you'll notice there that it had been closed in. And we'll be inside there in just a minute. There is one of the stones that would roll. My first thought when I saw that was, okay, maybe that's just a small one. But as I look at that door and I started thinking about this as Peter and John came, and I may be wrong on this. I do not picture the disciples as being my size. I picture them as being shorter guys. That was the norm. The norm was smaller. And so if Peter, as a smaller man, runs and has to stoop to get in, you're looking at a fairly low door. I don't know how much of a stone you're going to need. That thing is still going to be heavy enough to do it. But you, I don't know how much height you would really have had then if Peter and the disciples, if they had to stoop to go in, it's going to be a low door. So that, that was just a thought as I was looking at it. And that's an excellent point that you're bringing up. So this would have been a possibility of something that it would have resembled. And that trough, it could have rolled right across it. So that's in front of it. And you... Oh, no. Exactly. And you'll notice here, even with this thing where you can... If it has been expanded, whatever. Notice my side, and that's why I wanted this picture here to here. That's not very big. It's not going to be, you're going to have to stoop to get in. So that's why I wanted that perspective. Hopefully, that would help you to see it. Inside the tomb. So they would have come into that section. That's where they would have prepared the body, got it ready, and then set him over here. The door was in front of this part. So as you're looking into that hole, you would be able to see to the right where Jesus would have been. With rephrase, yeah, where Jesus would have been and where the angels were. That's what Mary would have seen. So that this this again makes more sense. For Mary and then to be able to look inside and see those things. If it was that mausoleum cube, I don't understand how the angels were in there. I mean, they could, but I just don't picture that as well. This is a lot more, to me, logical. That's the Jerusalem cross. And that would have been from not original, but later on, the, the Christians would have claimed it. So that was a Jeru that's the Jerusalem cross. So these are the sections. Again, this would have been the area right here. And I, who knows where he was uh, when they laid him in there. But this is the section that people would have seen as they looked inside the tomb. There's your Jerusalem cross again right up over where the body would have been laying. And I believe that is, yeah, our last one. So I like this picture. Now, obviously, this is all built back up. This is, you know, over you know, the way it is now. But this shows you where the stone would have come across. This has obviously been built in to repair it. And but this is very similar to what this place could have looked like. It's what the tomb area could have looked like.
Um, you can see why there would have been a gardener because that's what with, with the wine press and everything there, it would have been a rich man's place. He would have had to have employees. All of these things kind of fall in line more with a place like this. So let's, leave, uh, let's finish this passage, um, John 20, 11 to 18. Who has 11? Okay, and then who has 15 to 18? Okay, go ahead and read those. Sepulcher, uh huh. What? Yeah, sepulcher. Speaking, and as she left, she stood down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeing and see two angels in white sitting, and one on at the head and the other at the feet, where the bodies of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, I was the staff. She said unto them, God, they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, Said she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus was almost an argument with God. Who do you think it's God? Jesus is supposed to be the gardener and say, Sir, if you had sworn to him, you would tell me where he lay in the tumble. Jesus said to Mary, She turned herself and said, I'm giving you a rabbi. So she was just saying, No. Okay, so just seeing these places. This is the one that I would be leaning towards. I mean, obviously, I don't know, but but I'm encouraged by that. Think about this. You have the most powerful army in the world, and they wanted that body kept in the tomb. They didn't want that body gone. You had, the, now the Jews, you can say whatever you want. They, they were serious about wanting that body identified. They wanted that body in the tomb. They did not want that body gone. You had a big, and they're the ones running this town. And the Roman, so the Romans and the Jews both want that thing secure, and there is no body. We can't identify. I'm encouraged that we don't know the right place. We don't know where he was buried because there's no body there to prove it anymore. He's the only one that we can say that about. This is an encouraging thing. He is risen, and we should be praising him. So I'm encouraged that we don't know which one it is. There's confusion. That's a good thing. So all this being said, what are some truths? I know I pushed this over a little. What are some truths that we can learn from these scriptures, from this place? Can you give me one? I've got about four. So take them from me, please. Any truths from the scriptures, from the places you've seen? What are some truths that we can take away and apply to us? What are any of them? I didn't have that one. That's good. That's good. Keep seeking like Mary. She didn't quit. Things were hard. Things were tough. And she just, she didn't, she didn't lose her devotion. We need to be like Mary. Good point. I like the fact that as hard as they tried, they couldn't stop the resurrection. And they tried hard. They wanted it proven false. And because that happened, because of the resurrection, we have this confident expectation today. And that's the only reason. If it's not for that happening, we might as well, we can hang it up and go home. That is why we have our faith. Because he rose. He didn't stay in that tomb. Yes. Yes. That's right. Was. He was dead. And he's alive. Excellent. 
I mentioned this earlier, and this is going back to the very beginning, those Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm encouraged by those. I'm encouraged that we can see documents that were meticulously written out by the Essenes. That, and again, this was, I don't like using this phrase, but they were like the, the monks who just totally gave themselves to this work. And they left us accurate, um, copies of the word of God. And we have that. What we have in our hands today and what they did matches what we have through the centuries. God has kept his word accurate for us to be able to see. And I'm the Dead Sea Scrolls were a good validation of that. That we have the word of God and I'm grateful for it. We should be grateful for it. He would have. Greek, we got a lot of examples here, uh, and this one with Jesus, and what we're seeing with Paul, what we're seeing with the other disciples. Jesus said, "If they hated me, what? They're going to hate you." They hated me, they're going to hate you. Now, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm not saying he's wrong, Jesus was right. But what is implied in that is they, if they hated me, if you follow me and you walk in my footprint, so to speak, they're going to hate you. If you just claim his name and do your own thing and live like the world, they're not going to hate you. You're going to be one of them. But as you follow Jesus, they will hate you. That is exact, and, and we see it come to life. We see it. They hated Jesus. This is what they did to him. We see what they're doing to the Apostle Paul on Sunday mornings. We will be rejected as well. My, the, the, the encouraging thing for me, it's totally worth it. It is worth it to follow Jesus. What's not worth it to me is when we have Christians nowadays who say, I'm a follower of Jesus, but they're, they're, they, they, they're not. They're not serious-minded about following him. To me, that's not worth it. That's like playing both sides of the fence, and you're not satisfied either place. I want to be all out for Jesus, and that's where we're going to have our satisfaction. Just as Jesus wasn't tied to this earth, Jesus' hope was not here, so to speak. Neither should ours. It doesn't matter where we're buried. I, mean, I, I was talking at the funeral we just had. I was talking to one of the guys down at Noss and Sons. And I told him, and I was being kind when I said it. Um, he was telling me the normal is a, for price is around $12,000. And I said, that's a ripoff. And he said, I know. I said, that's why. I want to build my own for next to nothing. He said, you guys put it in a hole somewhere. I don't want, I don't want to give you guys any money. And he just kind of chuckled. He said, I agree. And he was good with it. This is not where my hope is. This body, when I'm dead, guess what? It's a shell. It's going to rot. It's no good. Nobody's going to care about it anyways in a couple of years. Then I'm, I'm done. I'm going to be with my Lord. That's all I care about. Put this thing in the ground and be done with it. Jesus wasn't all tied to this earth. His body was raised. He was gone. He went to be with the Father. That's what we need to be thinking on. I want to be prepared when I'm dead. I want to be prepared when that moment comes to meet my Lord. That's what I want. And I want to see that look. I've shared this with you before. My dad could do this so well. He, would, I would look at him. I would do something like King Stupid. Shouldn't have said it that way. I would do something really dumb. And my dad had this way of looking at me and not saying a word. And he would just kind of get this look. And he'd shake his head a little bit. And that look said everything. It said, Rick, you are dumb. You have no clue how bad you were. You do. And he, could, he would say a whole book load with this little shake of the head. I don't want Jesus to look at me and shake his head. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful.
This isn't where my hope is. My hope is with Jesus. And that's what I'm excited about. Anything else before we close? All right. Let's close in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for, for loving us. I thank you for coming to this earth and suffering in our place, taking our punishment to reconcile us back to yourself. Help us to be grateful for what you've done. Help us to live with an attitude of gratefulness. Lord, I pray that you would work in us and draw us closer to yourself. Lord, please help us this week to desire to please you. Give us a passion to live a life that is pleasing to you and honoring to you. And Lord, if it would please you, would you please allow us to see you working through us. Use us, God, to further your kingdom in some way this week. In Jesus' name, amen.